Allosaurus was predominantly a scavenger, at least according to one paper from 2021. And last year, 2022, there was a paper going, yeah, no, that, that paper that said it was mostly scavenging, that's probably not correct. And listed a whole myriad of reasons why that probably wasn't the case. The paper which addresses the they didn't scavenge paper can be condensed down to about four main points though. These points are that the first paper just ignored certain empirical evidence in the fossil record, evidence of hunting in Allosaurus, that the model assumed an unrealistic disadvantage to predation, that the model had some unrealistic beliefs about how available carrion would be in the environment, and that some of the papers cited were misrepresenting previous work that has been done on Allosaurus. So to start with the first one, we have good evidence that Allosaurus was hunting. And this includes things like an injury from likely a tail spike from a stegosaurus in the pelvic region of one Allosaurus. So essentially the Allosaurus was hunting or feeding on a stegosaurus and the tail spike from that stegosaurus went into the pelvis of the Allosaurus. And if the stegosaurus was already dead, it'd be really hard to get that tail to actually move into the pelvis of an Allosaurus. So it was most likely hunting this animal. There's also a bite wound on the plate of one stegosaurus, and the plate and the bite wound look pretty much identical to what we'd expect in Allosaurus as far as the overall jaw width and dimensions and length and whatnot. The authors went, well, stegosaurus probably didn't have a lot of meat on the plates, meaning that most of the rest of the carcass would have been picked over first, and then the Allosaurus would have gone in and grabbed this plate because it needed something to eat. And while well, sure, that could have been possible, it's also just about equally possible that it was hunting this stegosaurus and happened to bite the plate. It's not like the stegosaurus is going to sit there and let the allosaurus make a perfect bite on it. Instead, it would probably even potentially use some of those plates as some level of defensive measure. I mean, if you're gonna bite straight into bone instead of meat and bone, it's gonna be better for the stegosaurus, even if it does still hurt. And this kind of leads into one of the problems with this paper. They spend this time discussing like, oh, well, the stegosaurus was probably already dead, the rest of the carcass had rotten away or been eaten, and that's why this Allosaurus potentially just tried to bite one plate of this Stegosaurus. They don't really cite any evidence for why that would be the case. They just kind of make these assumptions, and there's problems with doing that in the sciences because you really need to have hard evidence of what you're trying to prove, even in paleontology. As much as paleontology is a science that is built a lot more on assumptions, you still need to be able to test those assumptions before you just say, these assumptions are correct. The authors also state that we don't know how that stegosaurus in question died, which means one of two things. It was probably scavenged when the allosaurus interacted with it, or it was hunted when the allosaurus interacted with it. Either one of these is equally valid because we just don't know and haven't tested those different hypotheses. It's something that we could potentially try and do a little more, but we just haven't gotten there yet. And as for the injury in the pelvic region of one allosaurus that was from a stegosaurus, the authors looked at a modern animal, the coyote which coyotes famously, not dinosaurs, and in this case, they will occasionally hunt moose when times are really lean. Essentially, they're gonna be very desperate and just go after whatever they can catch, even if it's very dangerous for them to do so. And they're going, oh, well, Allosaurus probably did the same. It would have scavenged most of the time and then hunted dangerous prey like Stegosaurus only when it needed to. The problem is coyotes don't only scavenge outside of hunting moose. They eat plenty of other things too. I mean, heck, I've seen them chasing jackrabbits plenty of times. It's just what they do. So the authors are taking one small part of a paper that's on animal that's not a dinosaur, still hunts and saying, see, this is evidence that dinosaurs didn't hunt as much, which obviously is gonna bring up some issues about why they're using that as their citation. They also use this injured Allosaurus pelvis to help suggest that, yeah, no, it was super dangerous for Allosaurus to hunt, which, this injury doesn't show signs of healing, so it probably did kill the Allosaurus, but it's important to remember that this is just one specimen of Allosaurus. We have a lot of Allosaurus fossils, many of which have pretty severe injuries, but that did heal. So it's not like they were just living totally carelessly and you know, reckless lives, just throwing themselves into Stegosaurus and getting injured all the time. There's a lot more variation in how they would have been living. This sort of idea brings up the kind of risk factors that they included in their study because some of their different models included death rates as high as 10% for hunting, which 10% of hunting is nuts to me. Imagine if every time you had a sandwich, it had a 10% chance to just kill you. You either wouldn't have sandwiches or people would just die out. 
It's a huge, huge outlying number that doesn't make a lot of sense when we're considering these animals would have been living for a decent amount of time. Not necessarily the shorter time periods that many modern day mammals do, at least in the wild. Sure, they wouldn't have been doing, you know, 50 plus years, but there's a good chance they were living over 20 to 25 years based on some of the histological studies we've had. So it's not that likely that they were dying off that quickly and that often when they were young. The authors then talked about how they just wanted to see if there would have been enough carrion from large sauropods that died in order to support a population of large carnivores like Allosaurus, which they didn't include any of the other animals to potentially also serve as carrion sources, which is a problem because if you're trying to understand the ecology of something, you want to try and understand as much of that environment as you can. For example, I was doing garter snake surveys in Oak Creek Canyon, and we were collecting poop from tiny lizards to try and understand how the poop actually influences the water chemistry in the creek. So like, teeny tiny little lizard poops. Totally important to study though. So the fact that they just ignored many of these animals that would have also been present in the environment is kind of an issue. This is especially true when you think about these Ornithischian dinosaurs that we find in the Morrison Formation where Allosaurus lived. Again, things like Stegosaurus, which would have been many tons, but also things like Camptosaurus, which still probably was around a ton, if not a little bit more, or an even Dryosaurus, which would still probably at least a few hundred pounds and a large one. So these are great sources of food that for some reason they're just like, these ones don't matter. It doesn't make a lot of sense when trying to understand the greater, broader environment. The authors who are arguing against this idea also mentioned that most modern day large scavengers are facilitated by birds. Essentially, they'll follow vultures to a site. And that most scavengers that are that kind of size mostly do fly. Essentially, you're not gonna be as able to get from place to place if you're stuck on the ground. In order to counter this idea, the authors in support of the scavenging idea looked at the size of sauropods and said, hey, look, its liver could be as much food as an entire stegosaurus. So like, yeah, that's great, but how often is that on the ground and how often is it gonna be approachable to eat? There's another assumption here. And the assumption is that modern day scavengers like vultures have a lot of very strong stomach mechanisms to help them digest bacteria that are growing and are toxic and not make them sick. They just kind of assume, well, Allosaurus probably had this too. I mean, birds are dinosaurs, so vultures are dinosaurs. There's no reason to think that Allosaurus couldn't except for the fact that they're separated by 145 million years of evolution at least. So we really need to take this just a couple steps back before we're just making these assumptions and assuming that they are fact. And as for being land-based, the authors point out that in some regions of Alaska during winter, it's much harder to hunt for wolves. Wolves also aren't dinosaurs, but during this time they become apex scavengers, essentially bullying everything else off of carcasses. You know what else they do during winter? They die a lot because despite scavenging, that's not enough to support their entire group or their entire population. It's one of those things where again, if Allosaurus was doing this the entire time throughout their lives, they would just be dying. They wouldn't have been successful enough to migrate to multiple continents and evolve into multiple species. One of the more egregious statements in this paper though is essentially the argument that Allosaurus didn't have a strong bite force, so it clearly didn't hunt which I have issues with that because we still have that good evidence that it did hunt, but also we have things like tooth wear in Allosaurus, which suggests that they ate meat and bone. So it's not like this was stopping them from being able to fully consume an animal that they did hunt. They still would have been able to do a lot of damage. It also kind of ignores the main hunting hypothesis of the puncture and pull method, where essentially they would bite in, grab a piece of meat, and then pull the whole thing out with their serrated teeth cutting it out then the animal would lose a lot of blood, potentially a significant organ or something, and then the Allosaurus would be able to go in and finish killing the animal. There's also this assumption that there would have been enough sauropod carrion in order to support all of these animals. And I think that's something that's a little weak because we don't understand the full life history of sauropods, but that it's very likely they were a type three animal, meaning they would have a bunch of babies, a lot of them would die, and then a few would live to adult age. And so if you're just counting, oh, well, they had this many eggs, there should be this much carrion, you're gonna run into problems because a lot of those animals are gonna die when they are very young. This then also means that the ones that do die on the landscape are gonna be fairly rare and in between. As much as the Morrison has a lot of sauropod material, 
some of that might just be a preservational bias. If sauropods are really large, it's harder for them to decay and wear down, meaning that they're more likely to get buried by sediment and preserved, at least in some cases, and it seems like the Morrison was one of those cases. So that means the sauropods on the environment that just died of natural causes might have been fairly far and few between. So there may not have been enough carcasses on the environment all the time for Allosaurus to support its population by primarily scavenging. I'm sure it still did, but we really just don't have the understanding of the life history of sauropods or of Allosaurus metabolism to really argue that it was scavenging that much. We, there's just a lot of things we don't know that this paper kind of assumes and then has the gall to say, oh yeah, it was definitely scavenging. 